We good? Yep. Fine. Okay. First things first, thank you very much for taking the time and trouble to come and see what we're doing here today. My name's Roy Gregory from the Audio Beat and I'm being uh, ably assisted by Sterling Trail. Set up man extraordinaire. <laughs> um, he needs to be because he had to do all the different arms. Um, what we're going to try and show you today is ways that you can take cartridge setup beyond the mere mathematical so that you can actually get extra performance from the record player you already own. So we're going to show you A, that it's possible and B, we're going to try and show you the kinds of techniques and, and approach you might use to get there. As usual with these seminars, there's a, a double agenda. There's what we're, we're telling you about, but there's also the opportunity for you to meet and uh, understand us a little bit. Um, so we always use equipment that uh, is either under review or has been recently reviewed by the Audio Beat. So it gives you a chance to look at the review, hear it here, hear what we say about it, and that way you get to calibrate us, which is important if what we write is going to be of any use to you at all. And uh, the equipment we're using is, in this instance, um, the recently reviewed Wilson Banesh Square 5. Um, this is a $16,000 speaker that looks a lot simpler than it really is. It's actually a four-way. So we've got mid-range, tweeter, mid-bass, and then we've got two downward firing isobaric bass units built into this solid aluminum block at the bottom of the speaker. Although it's actually a four-way speaker, it has a two-way electrical crossover. So we've got a first order crossover between the tweeter and the mid-range unit. Everything else rolls off mechanically. So it's actually a relatively inefficient speaker. It's, it's down around 89, 90 dB, but it's an incredibly easy load. So uh, it means that you get a nice tactile performance from it. The drivers make that configuration possible, and uh, Wilson Banesh make all their drivers in-house. The only exception in this speaker is the tweeter. But all of the, uh, the mid-range bass drivers and the AVR on the back are all built in-house. So you're getting a completely in-house designed speaker for $16,000, which is in itself quite unusual. But as I say, that's been recently reviewed. We're driving it with the Atlas and Janus signature from Aesthetics, again, just been reviewed. We like them a lot. It's an awful lot of amplifier for your money, and unusually and very usefully for this particular exercise, the Janus Signature preamp is a full facilities preamp in the old style. So it has a built-in um, phono stage of extremely good quality. Um, highly adjustable, and we will be using many of those adjustments for the various things that we're showing mm -hmm. over the different seminars, although we're actually pretty stable in this particular seminar. The turntable is our uh, more or less standard VPI Classic 3, um, which we always seem to use in these seminars, mainly because it gives us the facility to do interchangeable tone arms, which is essential to what we're doing here. And it also has a high degree of adjustability. Uh, it's reasonably affordable, and a lot of people have turntables very similar to it. So it, it keeps things real. The rack is the, uh, the new wood, wood frame rack from HRS which uh, we like a lot, and that's used mainly with their basic shelves, which are extremely good value, um, but we also have their new MXR shelf, is it? I believe it's the MXR. I'm, you'll have to forgive me on the acronyms. Is, there, we, is their entry level shelf, it's thirteen ninety nine, and it's proving to be a pretty extraordinary base. Yeah, it's very cool. Cabling, as usual, when I'm doing things, <laughs> is all Nordost. And uh, anyone who's been to one of these things before will know that I like to have the, the same cable right through the system. Whether it's Nordost, whether it's Crystal, whether it's tra transparent, it doesn't matter. The same cable right through the system is key. And the other wrinkle to what we're doing here is the tone arms. And uh, we've got three identical 3D printed tone arms with three identical cartridges mounted in them. The cartridges are actually uh, conse uh, consecutive serial numbers. And they are? They are. Uh, this is a, an interesting <laughs> point. 
as I say, what we're showing you is cartridge setup, and uh, one of the points we want to make is that this is not about $15,000 cartridges. What we're showing you works with pretty much any cartridge. So we're actually using moving magnets. We've got uh, the Clear Audio Maestro, which is their top moving magnet, and it's around the $1,000 mark. So it's not crazy by any stretch of the imagination. It's not peanuts, but it's not crazy. Um, I think we should start just by playing something yep. to let you get a sense of the system. So uh, let me just kill the aircon. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I ask what the cartridge output is? 0.4. So it's a medium. Uh, no, it's a standard moving magnet. Sorry, 0.4 or 4? 4. 4. four. four. Driving through the sunshine No children in the back seat No husband at the wheel No telling where she's going Just following the highway to Maryland Dreaming of leaving That's all it is Turntable set up exactly as per the manufacturer's instructions. So we're using the uh, VPI alignment jig, which they provide, which is a uh, Lofgren B geometry. We're tracking the clear audio cartridge at the recommended tracking force. We've got the arm level. Everything is as it would come out of the box if you just followed the instructions. So. Uh, Temperature. Temperature. <laughs> temperature. Where they allow us to live in areas where the temperature oh. changes up, up and down all the time. Um, generally speaking, running cartridges warm is always good. Um, so the first half an hour, you're gonna when you when you first start playing your record player, you're gonna feel it loosening up and opening out. And one way around that is you can actually use a little spot lamp over the cartridge to keep it warm. But you know, to be honest, as long as I mean there were there were there were tales of old with things like koetsus that were, were bought in the Far East and brought back here, and they were designed for different humidities and temperatures. And nowadays, I think it's less of a problem. The modern rubbers um, make it less of an issue. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. I mean, the room the room here, <laughs> the 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 last seminar we did yesterday, the temperature in the room varied by 12 degrees from the start to the finish. If you, live, <laughs> so, if, you, if you live in a really cold climate, though, in the winter, mm -hmm. for example, and yeah. your room tends to be cold, um, it is a really good idea just to put a little lamp over your over the turntable and let, turn it on for about half an hour before, okay. just to get the ambient temperature in the general area up a little bit. That will help. It's like a dry but Once it's up to temperature, it's going to stay there. Yeah. <laughs> but it does take a while to get there. Okay, so this is uh, a standard setup. Um, the one thing I did fail to mention was um, we're actually using the turntable on the Nordos salt feed, which uh, I find a very effective upgrade on any classic. So anybody who's using a VPI table, that's something to look at very seriously. What we're going to do now is uh, we're going to actually just uh, play something different. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is not so much the notes that we're playing you, but the gaps between the notes. So what I want you to listen to is the spaces between the notes, because that's what's going to be changing here. And uh, we're going to start by playing you a little bit of bassy, because uh, he has a fantastic way with rhythm. So let's... Uh yep. Now you're knowing what 
that little staccato piano opening that's so jagged and so disjointed that the spacing of the notes becomes super critical. So that's what we we're asking you to listen to. change the tone arm. So we're re replacing this tone arm with identical tone arm, same cartridge, only this time instead of the VPI protractor it's been set up with this which is the acoustical system smart tractor. So this will be the same geometry or the same mathematics, it's actually Lofgren A in this instance as opposed to B, but uh, same geometry just done with considerably more precision. So all you're going to hear now is the difference between the cartridge set up using the free protractor and the cartridge set up by the same guy using a much, much more precise device. And the ways in which this is more precise, it's not rocket science, it's things like they give you three spindle collars of different diameters so that you can actually get the protractor really snug on the spindle of the record player. So there's no slot there, because that will introduce error. But the most important thing about this is the loop. And, uh, <laughs> and these, these are available from photographic shops. I think this one's actually a thread counting loop from a fabric, um, from a fabric manufacturer or producer. But this enables you to see what the hell you're doing. It's as simple as that. And all you're trying to do is get the stylus on the point. And it's really difficult if you can't see it. So this can be added to any protractor. You can pick one of these up for 10, 12 bucks. And photography shops? Photography shops sell them. Um, um, they're not hard to find. You can find them online. And if you go online and, and Google uh, thread counting loop. Mm -hmm. Loop is yeah. L-O-U-P or L-O-U-P? L-O-U-P-E. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, what, is the, what is that protractor again? Smart this tractor. Acoustical systems, smart tractor from Germany. And the magnification on the loop, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. Enough. <laughs> so it's <awesome>. A lot. <laughs> okay, so this is with the uh, smart tractor alignment tool. to understand now what I mean about the gaps between the notes. Suddenly it sounds much more like he's placing the notes, he's waiting, he's letting the piano settle, you can hear the instrument decay, then the next one comes, and, and that jagged shape that he's making becomes much, much more apparent. And it's exactly the same cartridge, exactly the same turntable, all that is is getting the overhang much, much more precise, getting the alignment more precise. So what we're going to do now is... Uh, oh, can I ask how you're adjusting the azimuth, by the way? Is it by I uh, will get there. We'll get there. <laughs> that comes later. <laughs> but they were all set up the same way. Yeah. Identical. Yeah. Same methodology throughout. So what this is, what you're going to hear now, again, same arm, same cartridge, but set up with a different curve, a different set of geometry. So Lofgren, Beowald, all dates from 37, is it? 37. 37. So basically, we've been using the same mathematics to set cartridge relative to record for, well, since 1937. These guys have done the first new geometrical calculations that we're aware of. And uh, they term their curve Unidin. And um, uni, Unidin. U-N-I-D-I-N. Unidin. Um, as in the DIN standard from Europe. And uh, what they've done is they've 
they've done a cur they've done a curve which is designed first of all to maximize tracking ability for the end of side specifically partly because the if you if you look at records and you look at the music that's recorded on them particularly classical records they tend to end with a large climax you know classical symphonies end with a band and um, you know, those, those, those big modulated grooves are the hardest to track. So set the thing up so, it, so at the end of the side it's, it, it's actually tracking as well as it can. So that's the first thing they've done. But the other thing they've done is they've, um, if, you, if you look at, the, if you look at the, the offset error across something like a Lofgren, it would be like that as it went through the two nulls. The Unidin is designed to reduce that so it's a much flatter. So the variation across the record is much lower, and it's the variation that we tend to hear. So that's what they're aiming for. So this is just, again, the same thing, but with a different curve. Two, two null points. Also. Two null points. It's the same, it's, they're, they're, it looks very much like the Lofgren B mm -hmm. curve. The null points are very close to Lofgren B. Right. As Roy pointed out, the rate of change as, it, as the tracing distortion increases and decreases is much more shallow. Okay. And that is rate of change is what we're jump. This is a temple of fire. Sweet spot, those two null points. Are you you still getting the best, or is it yeah. rounded a little bit? No, no, no. It's just that the rate of the the rate at which it changes, it still reaches the same null points. Okay. The overall distortion and tracking lo um, levels are a little tiny bit lower, but that's not what you're hearing. You're really hearing the, the rate of distortion change. How about <laughs> flow within the music there's a there's a, a graceful progression through it which I really like and in fact now whenever I have a cartridge in for review whenever I'm setting up turntables that's what I use I use unity that's my choice now yesterday we had a guy sat in that seat there and he said he said I prefer the second one yeah and that's totally cool yeah it doesn't matter you're another one. Yeah, I was about to say that. I've yeah. heard the previous one. Yeah. Much yeah. more calmer, ease. Yeah. Uh, it has a more natural um, sound to it, I think. The point here is, we're not saying you need to use Unity. That's not what we're saying. We happen to like it. But what we're saying is the curve you use matters. Yeah. So you should make an informed choice. Don't just ne ne necessarily accept what happens to come with the turntable. Because, as you've just heard, the curves, the geometry you use, has quite a significant effect on the way the system presents. And you will prefer one as opposed to another. So, it's, that's, that's the first thing. You need to consider that and make a decision. Sorry, yeah. Do I need a jig to set that up then? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You need a jig to set up any turntable. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only one who hasn't used one? <laughs> no. no? Okay. no. Don't worry, we'll come back. <laughs> so, like I say, the first thing is, it makes a difference. And the second thing is that part of that difference depends on the records you own and the records that you prefer to play. So, for instance, um, in Britain, Decca aficionados really like the Stevenson curve because Decca tended to have very wide cuts and they run right in close to the label. So, their actual... The, the width of the cut surface on the record tends to be very wide on a decker. So obviously, where you're placing the null points matters. Yeah, so on, the, on Stevenson, the second null point is at the Liat group. Mm. <laughs> so so yeah. that, means now, that, the, that means out here is not so great, actually. Mm. But yeah. it yeah. will track that step inside. Mm. 
But at the same time, if you've got a collection of 70s and 80s pop, and it's okay, you don't have to admit it. <laughs> but if you do, then you know the, the groove cuts tend to be very narrow. Yeah. So, so look at the curves, look at where the knolls are, look at what's going to work for, you, for the records that you like to play, and have a listen to them, because they do sound different. And one of the advantages of the Smart Tractor is it does give you five different alignment geometries to choose from, to play around with. And they're all equally valid, they're all equally precise, depending on what you need it for. I mean, the, the main reason that we played you the unit in is because A, it's novel, it's new, it's something that most of you probably won't ever have heard before, and it does sound very, very different to the established curves, mm -hmm. and that's the point. Yeah. But even within the curves, they do, you know, even within the various loft groups, they do sound different. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. the next thing we're going to do is uh, look at uh, tracking force. And uh, the first thing, the first thing I want to get you to do is stop listening to the music as a whole. What we're going to try and suggest here is that there are very specific sonic attributes that append to each adjustment that you make. So you can hear tracking force in one particular way. You can hear azimuth in another way. So you need to be listening, if you're adjusting tracking force, this is the thing you need to be listening to. And uh, shall we tell them what we should be listening to beforehand? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <coughs> Our feeling is that when you're listening to tracking force, when you get it nailed, you get a, a much more concentrated sense of the center of notes. So if we go back to this concept of the spaces between notes, as you get the tracking force, just so, that space locks in. It gets wider and wider and wider, and then you know exactly how big the gap between those notes is. So in other words, the note, rather than bleeding across, is concentrating down and focusing right to the point in time and space where it should be. So what we're going to do is we'll play you a different bassy track, this time, as I say again, starting with the cartridge and the manufacturer's recommended tracking course. Okay. Not where we not where you just heard it. Sorry, can I just sorry. The thing to listen to here, there are there are two things in this excerpt. One is there are stamped piano chords. Just listen to the spacing of them and how predictable they are. And secondly, there's a walking bass. And just uh, listen to the pitch definition in the bass. Those are the only two things you need to listen to. actually our preferred value for this cartridge. In this instance, we're increasing it. We might have had to decrease it. There's no, there's no heavy is better, light is better here. Start from the manufacturer's rec recommended value, work up, work down. But, uh, In what kind of increase? Um, tenth of a gram. Go, yeah, go, go, by, go by tenth of a gram. Once you're in the zone, you're getting down to literally the smallest increment you can do. And as you change it, are you realigning the cartridge? Yes. Yes. You okay. are. But we'll come back the, to that. the realignment that you're doing is not going to significantly throw off what you need to listen to for this. Yeah. Sure. It does throw it off. That's a really good point. But you, um, it won't alter what's important here. Okay. So, sorry, is that, this is clearer audio maestro moving magnet? Maestro, yeah. Moving magnet is that? Yeah, moving magnet. Moving magnet. And, and the, the original was the middle of the range? All the, Oh, the uh, 2.3, which is their recommended. Okay. Of course. Okay. So the range is like 2.1 to 2.6. Okay. And we're at 2.3. They, they had a specified recommended at 2.3. Okay. And we're now at 2.55. Okay.
Again, I don't think that's a subtle difference. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, yeah, not only you know, do those piano chords cover much more obviously regulated intervals, there's more texture in them, uh, you know, um, the, the steps in the bass line are much more obvious, the whole thing's moving forward, but it's, it's much more persuasive. Mm -hmm. Should we go up a bit? Sure. So we'll, 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 we'll go up to the top of the recommended tracking force range. We're actually using the, um, the Soundsmith counterintuitives on the, on the, um, on the counterweight. Those are great, aren't they? Which is just like a little eccentric subweight. It means you can make tiny adjustments really easily. And anybody who's got an arm that they fit, and they fit quite a few arms, I really, really recommend them. <laughs> They're not so correct. <laughs> yeah, sluggish, heavy, clumsy. Yeah. So it's not just like, you know, that it's a continuum. It goes from, you know, not so great to just right and then yeah. off. I know, yeah. I mean, that was about 0.05 up. Yeah, about, yeah. And what we're doing, every generator, whether it's moving coil or moving magnet, has the point where the generate the, there's some moving part and magnets. And there's going to be a point where there's a, the moving part is in the middle of the, the most uniform part of the flux field. And once there, the, the moving part has its most freedom of movement in any one direction. It's not being electromechanically damped by that mag magnetic mechanism. So it can- yeah, As soon as you move it out of that center point, you immediately start to apply an electrical force to it. Right. And well, that's, a, that's damping. And the problem is that it's not linear. You can't just say, if I go up and it, it, you may find a good spot here, then it goes bad, then it goes good again. Mm -hmm. It's not a linear flux field. Okay. I mean, what you're hearing here, I mean, what, what, what Sterling's just explained, this idea of, 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 of getting the generator mechanism into its, its neutral position, what, what happens is once you, get a, once you get an impulse of the stylus, because it's free to move, it moves as far as it needs to as quickly as it can, which is obviously the whole point of the, the exercise. And that's exactly what you're hearing if you think about it. If you think about that mechanics mm -hmm. and how, um, how that affects what you're hearing, it just feels like the thing's just taking its lead boots off. Right, sorry, sir, yeah. I seem to believe in cartridge break-in, and how does yeah. this statement, previous statement, changes as cartridge break-in occurs, and yes, how long of course. it takes? If you um, I, wouldn't, I, I would not do a really in-depth cartridge setup until you've got a good 100, probably 200 hours on the cartridge. So get it in the ballpark, run it, then when it's settled, Absolutely, good point. Yeah. Although I will tell, I will, I will um, one comment on that. Um, because the suspension system is the primary thing that needs to kind of break in and kind of seed in, if you will, um, any sort of um, abnormal uh, um, behavior by the stylus or the generator is going to be exacerbated by a, stiff, by a stiff suspension system. So if you follow some of these guidelines that we're talking about today, a brand new cartridge will end up sounding a lot better than you think it does. <laughs> It's Even because, from you. because it's 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 uh, not fighting with the suspension system. But if you do it, if you do an in-depth setup on a brand new cartridge, yeah, after a couple hundred hours, you're going to have to go yeah, back absolutely. to the system. So yeah. the next thing we're going to look at. Are, are you going to talk about tools for tracking force too? Sure. Isn't that what like I think I've got a little. Well, so what, what you need what you need to be able to do is get to uh, a really close ballpark of where the manufacturer's recommend, recommended is. So if it's 2.3 and you have a little sure balance gauge and mm -hmm. you get to 2.3, that's fine because you're not going to be using the balance gauge to do your final. Okay. You're, you're doing it by ear. By ear. And like I say, point. once you get down to the short strokes, I mean, you are literally, you're going to be going over to your counterintuitive here and you're just going to be like, touching it. <laughs> right? And so we don't really care what the final number results in. What we care about is the result. Because it's going to be different for every cartridge. Right. The so thing these I, three cartridges all have different optimal The training. thing what I would want you to do, though, is at the end of your exercise, make sure you're not wildly out of the manufacturer's window. Okay? So you're, you're applying damping to that. And you don't want to put too much damping or too little damping for what that, that last was designed for. 
So does the optimal tracking weight depend on how you load the cartridge as well, whether you use an input yeah, because that's a damp or solid state? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. That's a damp. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excuse me okay? one second. Do we not need to change the record? BTA? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> he could be doing that while we're answering your question. Yes, it absolutely does. And loading, particularly for coils, is super critical because it's literally, it's like dialing in the shock absorber on a sports car. Mm -hmm. You know, you're affecting the damping, so yes, absolutely. And every single thing that we're talking about here is interrelated. So you, you cannot first, adjust one thing. Do you, would you change the damping first, and the way you load the cartridge, or the way you track it? I, 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 set, the, I set the loading first, then I, do the, then I do the tracking force, then I go back, and, um, and one of the themes that's gonna come out of this is that this is a circular process. Mm -hmm. So you go right through the process, and when you get back, you're going to have made a bunch of adjustments, and now your your geometrical alignment is going to be very slightly out. So you start over again, <laughs> and over again, and each time you're narrowing the window. So, so you, you come back to each one after a while anyway. Yeah. So. so when I do a, a cartridge setup from start to finish, I may align the cartridge seven or eight times. Wow. He's obsessive. I had to stop him. <laughs> I, I actually had to stop him. I had to say, Sterling, we're really running out of time here. <laughs> but, but you're, you're bringing me down to such a small mm -hmm. thing that, you know, oh, I can see that. Yeah. at the end of it, you make the tiniest little uh, alignment correction, mm -hmm. and you're like, wow. And the closer you That's get, it, what, what's, what's bizarre is the closer you get, and you're making these tiny, tiny incremental changes, but the differences you're hearing are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So, right, what we're going to do now is uh, look at VTA, SRA, arm height. People, I don't really care what people call it, frankly. I mean, you have this big argument, you know, I, 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 give, I give sterling hives every time I mention the VTA word, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and you know, because technically it's SRA, but the industry kind of adopted VTA, and then there's arm height, and, it's all basically the same deal. Stylus position. Basically, what we're talking about is, if that's the arm, that's the stylus on the end of it, you alter the height, and as you do that, you alter the angle of the tip in the groove. So that's what we're gonna be listening to. Now, people think that SRA is, <laughs> <laughs> is, all, about, is all about sound staging. Oh, I've got the SRA on there and, and the sound stage just locked in. Or tunnel down. Yes, it does affect yeah. the sound stage, it affects the depth. But it's not actually the most important thing it does. And it's not the easiest way to hear it. What it affects are dynamic range and timing. And it really affects timing. So literally, as you approach optimum SRA, the record gets louder. It gets louder. You can hear it. You will hear it. More information. It, what it is, it's, it's, it's increasing the dynamic range, so it is literally getting louder. But also, you, coming back to our gaps between the notes thing, the tracking force tells you how big the notes are. What SRA tells you, or how big the gaps are, sorry. What SRA tells you is where those gaps are relative to each other. So the rhythm locks in. The thing gets tighter, quicker, much more emphatic, much more purposeful. So let's have a listen. We're going to start with the arm low, and then you'll just lift it and and he'll tell you what he's doing. Okay, so we're low now. We're just going to see the, the um, this is back to Eleanor McAvoy. And are we optimized on the tracking force now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Crazy long leading groove here, sorry. <laughs>
I was lost. I uh, left correct. I played the fool. I played my game. Now beyond. Winning some along the way. But all this time, it was a shame. And if only me to you correct. For how I lost my way. And so I locked myself inside. I nursed my broken, wounded pride. And in my eagerness Down. to hide. Left my heart behind. Yeah. Clear? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not difficult to hear. <laughs> now, I use uh, JMW arm. When I'm listening to records at home, I adjust the SRA for every single record I play. Because it's so easy. It really isn't that difficult. All you do, you put the record on, you plonk it in the middle, you twiddle it off until it's you know, is loud and locked in, then you just start the record again. And it's, it's like 10 seconds. And look at the difference it makes. So, what you're listening for with SRA is the loudest, but also the crispest in rhythmic terms, the tightest rhythms, the quickest rhythms. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. As you change, Yes. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? You're listening to you're with this circular. Yeah. You keep going round and round, so and you're, so you're when you optimize uh -huh. your VTA yeah. and your tracking force, one and the same. When you change it back yeah. for the record, you're back. So you, that yeah, all you're doing is you're, you're 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 coming in. And this is where it's important to compartmentalize how you listen. Yeah. So when you're listening to tracking force, you're listening to one specific criteria. Yeah. yeah. And then when you go to SRA, you ignore that mm -hmm. and only listen for what you want to listen for for SRA, and when you do azimuth, you ignore the other two and only listen to azimuth, and then you go back and only listen. To so if you can compartmentalize it, then you, you get away from the pitfalls of trying to change SRA by changing tracking force and things like that. Now, just so that we've got a sense of scale here, those adjustments were plus or minus five graduations on the VPI scale. I might offer here that um, I have a friend who has the VPI classic yep. three, and I have a turntable and I have a triplaner on. Mm -hmm. We both bought the same platter mat and at the same time, and he said, in order to move my arm up five millimeters, I have to turn a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I will tell you that on the triplane. Which I also have. <laughs> it, is, it is not such a fine adjustment. No, it's not. So I have gotten to a point where uh, it is change to change the VTA between records is quite difficult, actually, because and this I think it's the, arms. Mm, yeah. The, because you can, almost can't move yeah. the dial yeah. a, uh, small enough. Exactly. The, one of the reasons I love this arm is because it has that facility and it's so beautifully executed. You're absolutely right. I also have a triplaner. You can do it, but yeah, you're it's right. You need to be hold. very, and it's, and it's a little bit sloppy. Right. Just a shade. Right. Well, I mean, you can do it, but. It's, the, the gradients aren't fine enough on it. So. On, that, on, that, on that mechanism, we're going plus or minus five notches, as it were. There's a hundred right. notches round, round the knob. Right. So we're moving it one twentieth of a revolution. That's one twentieth of a thread. And it's a very, very fine thread, as you just pointed out. Yeah. So we are moving the arm height by an almost infinitesimally small right. amount. Right. Well, I, will, I will tell you, I've had conversations with Tree about yeah. this, and he says, I've shown him on the arm hmm. what a VTA significant hmm. movement is. Hmm. He says, you can hear that? Yeah. And I said, Absolutely. Really? <laughs> well, bear in mind, you know, we're changing the angle of a face on the stylus mm. that's five microns wide. Mm -hmm. So you know those little carbon fiber brushes you have? Yeah. Yeah. Pull one, right. one off, right. it's about that size. I think the really significant thing here, though, is the amount of height difference we're putting into this arm is way less way, way less than the difference in thickness between a 180 gram record and a 120 gram record. Oh, yeah. So, this idea, 
the idea that it's possible to set the arm up once to play every single record perfectly is complete rubbish. You forget that one for starters. That ain't happening. <laughs> you know, so anyway. What I, what I would recommend, though, is, you know, if you don't want to follow the path of bandits of him, <laughs> <laughs> look, um, look, look, mark, look. Mark, mark where a uh, standard record yeah. thickness is, mark where a 180 is, yeah. mark where a 45 is, and then just move it to those places. If you don't want to, mm. if you don't have an arm that can be, you can facilitate an SRI change easily, you know. So. There, there, there was a, an American reviewer who was uh, married to a clinical psychologist. And um, we uh, we met we met at a we met at an evening event, and uh, she said to me, you know, to be an audio reviewer, you've got to be at least borderline OCD. She's <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> oh right, sorry, we need to tell you what we're doing. Um, <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're gonna show you azimuth now, which is if you like the third of the three basic adjustments. Um, azimuth, just to be totally clear, is if you like, the vertical angle of the stylus into the groove. So that would be neutral, and then it rotates like that. So again, using the counterintuitive, we can set the, we can set the stylus neutral, and then we can actually adjust it by tiny increments repeatedly. So we're gonna start with the azimuth off. Off? Yeah, so we, we're, we're a little bit out, and we're gonna play that again. Incredibly tough. <laughs> uh, no, it's tier. <laughs> tier two. It looks very similar. Uh, the the Valhalla two has um, it has color coding down the outer. So just the, the very outer strands. There's one red and one black, and these are all black. Okay. Okay. correct it the whole thing just sounds planted and stable and <coughs> it's like when the notes start they've got a, a, a ground plane almost to start from so just how loud they are exactly how loud they are is very clear whereas before it was just a bit floaty and a bit indistinct and a bit aimless wasn't really going anywhere now it's got a sense of purpose and forward motion and that is half a square on the counterintuitive scale so you have a, like a sticky graph paper that goes around the counterweight that you move the eccentric weight against. And that was half a square deviation of a very light weight riding over a big counterweight. So that's how critical azimuth is. 
It's really critical. And I come from a country where we make tone arms that don't actually allow you to adjust it. Cross screws only. No, no, most of them just actually don't let you adjust it at all. <laughs> you know, you just have to you just have to hope that you don't get a Friday afternoon arm when the guy wasn't quite. <laughs> okay. Um, what we'll do now is we'll now play you the first track we played. So you heard it, the setup as it were, flat as per the manufacturer's destructions. Now we will play it as we've got to at this point. exactly the same record player, it's exactly the same system. All it is, is a little bit of care and attention to set up. So that's how much more you can get out. And that's really just like a first round. As we keep saying, once you get to that point, now the next step would be go back, check the alignment, but then go back through and check all of the parameters again. So you're coming, you're narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down until you get right in the sweet spot. This is just first stage. And it makes that much difference. So, now, and for you perfectionists out there that heard maybe little things going on in that last playback, mm -hmm. you know, I'm approximating trying to move this thing all over the place. Yeah. You know? So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, when I optimized it for where it really sounded the best, I know I'm not there right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I got it close, but. So, you're sitting at home, and you've got your record player, and you've got your ten thousand dollar moving coil. And you get the gas and key out and you think, not sure how comfortable I am doing this. Um, and 20 years ago, when everybody had a record player, then this was the responsibility of dealers. Yeah. And there were some really, really good dealers out there who really knew what to do. Nowadays, sadly, they're very few and far between. Yeah. Most of them have either lost the skill set or never had it. Or got mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, gone, all gone sane and got out of the industry, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I think there's actually a, a, a change happening in the industry at the moment. And um, whereas before we used to rely on dealers, those, those guys really aren't available and in many, many cases aren't equipped. And yet, there's lots of people out there with really seriously expensive hi-fi systems. And therefore, there's actually another kind of product in play here, which we haven't thought about. And this is a product that we'll actually be reviewing quite soon. And it's him. Yeah. He, he is a facility. And you can hire him to come and do this for you. And I think that this is actually going to become an increasingly common occurrence. You are going to have a range of people who have retained these skill sets. And it's not just turntables, it's speaker setup, it's everything. So you've got your system. The single most cost effective investment you can make in it is to get someone who really knows what they're doing to come and fix it for you. And so, as I say, we will be reviewing Sterling Trail as well. <laughs> <laughs> we promise you, no full frontal photography. <laughs> anyway, on that happy note, thank you very much for coming, thank you for your time, and I hope thank that you. was interesting. Yeah.